In this section here, we're starting to look at evolution. It's chapter 22, but this corresponds with Descent with Modification, a Darwinian view of life. The new era of biology began in 1859 with Charles Darwin's work, The Origin of the Species. This focuses the biologist's attention on the great diversity of organisms. Darwin noted that current species were descendants of ancestral species, that they came from species that were here before them. Evolution can actually be defined by Darwin's phrase, descent with modification. Evolution is both a pattern and a process. So this is Charles Darwin. His ideas actually had deep historical roots. He was not the first one with these ideas, and he was not the only one with these ideas at that time. So here we can look and see this is where you have the origin of the species published. Here is when Charles Darwin was born. And here's a couple of significant works here that are well before his birth, where we have the Malthus that published his essay on the principle of population, and Hutton that proposes his principle of gradualism before Darwin's even born. And then Lamarck published his hypothesis of evolution right around the same time. So these are additional works that have contributed here to Darwin's work and helped provide support for his ideas. So the Greek philosopher Aristotle viewed the species as fixed, that once they were here on the planet, they were here, they didn't change, and he arranged them on a scala naturae. The Old Testament holds that species were individually designed by God and therefore perfect, so they existed in their perfect form from the beginning. Carolus Linnaeus interpreted the organism's adaptation as evidence that the creator had designed each species for a specific purpose. Linnaeus actually was the founder of taxonomy, the branch of biology that classified organisms. And he's the one who developed the binomial nomenclature format for naming species, such as Homo sapiens. So Darwin was able to study fossils, and that helped to lay the groundwork for some of his ideas. Fossils are remains or traces of organisms from the past. Most of the time they're found in sedimentary rock, which will appear in layers called strata. So the deeper the strata, the older the organisms are, or the fossils. So Paleontology is the study of fossils. This was largely developed by the French scientist Georges Cuvier. Cuvier speculated that the boundaries between the strata represented catastrophic events. So each time you switch to a different kind of layer, there was a catastrophic event that caused that. Geologists James Hutton and Charles, Charles Lyell perceived that the changes in the Earth's surface can result from slow, continuous actions that are still operating today and at the same rate. So their work strongly influenced Darwin's ideas and thinking. So Lamarck hypothesized that species evolved through the use and disuse of body parts and inheriting acquired characteristics. The mechanisms he proposed are unsupported by evidence, but he did have early ideas and an early hypothesis of evolution. So there was some doubt about the permanence of species prior to Darwin's idea of them being modified over time. So scientists were questioning the idea that a species was not changing before Darwin even suggested it. So as a boy and into adulthood, Charles Darwin did have a consuming interest in nature. He first studied medicine and then theology at Cambridge University. After he graduated, he took an unpaid position as a naturalist and was a companion to Captain Robert Fitzroy. Took a five-year voyage on the Beagle around the world. During his travels on the Beagle, Darwin collected specimens from South America of plants and animals. What he noticed was that fossils resembled living species from the same region, and living species resembled other species from nearby regions. While he was out, he experienced an earthquake in Chile and observed the uplift of rocks. So Darwin was influenced by, L by Lyell's principles of geology and thought that the Earth was actually more than 6,000 years old. 
So his interest in geography and the geographic distribution of the species was kindled by a stop at the Galapagos Islands that are located west of South America. He hypothesized that the species from South America had colonized the Galapagos and then speciated or turned into their own unique species while on the island. So here you can see the route of the beagle that he took. It started here in Great Britain, came down around South America, came up over and across, down around through the southern ocean here around New Zealand, Tasmania, Australia, and came through. Here is where the Galapagos Islands are. So what Darwin perceived was that the adaptation to the environment and the origin of a new species were closely related. So in looking at studies made years after Darwin's voyage, biologists concluded that this is what happened to the Galapagos finches, that they were isolated on the Galapagos Islands and then had speciation events while they were separated on the islands. In 1844, Darwin wrote an essay on natural selection as the mechanism of descent with modification, but he didn't introduce his theory publicly at this time. So natural selection is a process where individuals with favorable traits are going to be more likely to survive and reproduce. So those traits do have to be inherited and then passed on to their offspring. In June 1858, Darwin received a manuscript from Alfred Russell Wallace, who had developed a similar theory of natural selection, similar to Darwin. Darwin quickly finished the origin of the species and published it the next year. So he was not alone in the ideas. He is the one who gets most of the credit for it, even though there were others at the time working with similar ideas. So Darwin had three broad observations. There was unity in life, there was diversity of life, and the organism seemed to match their environment. So interestingly enough, Darwin never used the word evolution in his first edition of The Origin of the Species. Instead, the phrase descent with modification was used to summarize his perception of the unity of life. The phrase refers to the view that all organisms are related through descent from an ancestor that lived in the remote past. So that there was a common ancestor that had modified and developed into the current species we see today. So in the Darwinian view, life history is like a tree with branches that represents life's diversity. Darwin reasoned that large morphological gaps between related groups could be explained by this branching process and past extinction events. So here is an example of some of his work showing things branching off where he would have one organism that would branch into different ones and that you could see it just continue to branch like a tree as there was descent of new organisms with their own unique modifications. So here, if we look on this diagram, you can see, or back here, you would have a common ancestor and how each one would branch off and then divide into new variations themselves and how this went on to produce the elephants that we currently see today. And then this is the time frame in millions of years ago. So Darwin noted that humans have modified other species by selecting and breeding individuals with desired traits in a process called artificial selection. So artificial selection is done with creating the various breeds of dogs is a real common example. He drew two inferences from his observations. So here we can see where you have this wild mustard plant and that we've taken different variations from this to make different types of plants. So kale is going to be, has the wild mustard as an ancestor. This plant was selected for its leaves. Brussels sprouts were selected for their axillary buds. Cabbage was selected for its apical bud, the tip. Broccoli selected for its flowers and stems, and then kohlrabi from its stems. But they all originated from the wild mustard plant. 
So one of his observations was that members of a population often vary in their inherited traits. So we have ladybugs here, but they have some variation in the types of orange and the types of dots that they have on their backs. So his second observation was that all species can produce more offspring than the environment can support. So many of these offspring are not going to survive and reproduce. So here it's showing a puffball releasing spores into the air. You're going to have millions of spores being released, but very few of them will actually turn into puffballs. So inference number one, the individual whose inherited traits give them a higher probability of surviving and reproducing in a given environment will tend to leave more offspring than the other individuals. So if they're better adapted to their environment, they're most going to be more likely to survive and go on to create offspring. Inference number two, the un equal ability of individuals to survive and reproduce will lead to the accumulation of favorable traits in the population over generations. So if you have those that are stronger being more likely to produce offspring, over time you're going to have stronger and stronger individuals that are going to make up the population. The population will shift over time and adapt. So Darwin was influenced by Thomas Malthus, who noted the potential for the human population to increase faster than food supplies and other resources. So if some heritable traits are advantageous, these will accumulate in a population over time, and this will increase the frequency of individuals with these traits. So this explains the match between the organisms and their environment. So just as a natural selection summary, individuals with certain inheritable traits will survive and reproduce at a higher rate than other individuals. Natural selection increases the match between the organisms and their environment over time. And if an environment changes over time, natural selection may result in an adaptation to these new conditions and may give rise to new species. So natural selection is an ongoing process. So these are some examples of adaptation in different environments, a flower mantid in Malaysia, a flower-eyed mantid in South Africa, and then a leaf mantid here in Borneo. So different adaptations in different places. So one thing to note in here is that Individuals do not evolve, it's populations that evolve over time. So an individual is not going to change their genetic makeup. They're not going to change the traits that they have that, and how they are adapted to the environment. What you will see is overall in a population that you will see the changes over time. So natural selection can only increase or decrease heritable traits that vary in a population. And adaptations vary with different environments. So different environments are going to have different traits be stronger, and therefore the ones that would be passed on. So new discoveries continue to fill in the gaps by Darwin in The Origin of the Species. So there are four types of data that help to document the pattern of evolution. We have direct observations, homology, the fossil record, and biogeography that all help to support Darwin's idea. Two examples provide evidence for natural selection. So natural selection in response to introduced plant species and the evolution of drug-resistant bacteria. So when we look at introduced species here, the soapberry bugs use their beak to feed on seeds within fruits. Feeding is most effective when the beak length matches closely to the seed depth within the fruit. So a bigger beak is not better, a smaller beak is not better. The one that's the proper length is what's going to be most advantageous. So in southern Florida, soapberry bugs feed on the native balloon vine with larger fruit, so they need to have longer beaks. In central Florida, they feed on the introduced golden rain tree that has smaller fruit, so these have shorter beaks. And we see a correlation between fruit size and beak size. This has also been observed in Louisiana, Oklahoma, and Australia. In all cases, the beak size has evolved in populations that feed on introduced plants with fruits that are smaller or larger than the native fruits. So these are examples of evolution by natural selection. In Florida, this evolution in beak size occurred in less than 35 years. So evolution can occur fairly quickly, but birds also tend to have a fairly short lifespan and reproduce quite quickly. 
So this is an example of the soapberry bug. And this is a comparison of the beak size here on the balloon vine in southern Florida, and then the golden rain tree in central Florida. When we look at the evolution of drug-resistant bacteria, so the bacteria Staphylococcus aureus is commonly found on people. It's on the skin. In one strain, the methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, sometimes called MRSA, is a dangerous pathogen. The resistance to penicillin evolved in Staph aureus by 1945, two years after it was first widely used. So the resistance to methicillin evolved in Staph aureus by 1961, again, only two years after it was first widely used. So what methicillin does is it works by inhibiting a protein used by the bacteria to make their cell walls. So the MRSA bacteria use a different protein in cell wall production. So when they're exposed to methicillin, the MRSA strains are more likely to survive and reproduce than the non-resistant Staph aureus strains. So the MRSA strains are now resistant to many antibiotics. So it's going to select for the organism that is going to have the traits that allow it to survive in the presence of those antibiotics. So this is showing your annual hospital admiss admissions with MRSA by thousands. And you can see since 1993 up to 2005 how it has drastically increased. So natural selection does not create new traits, but it edits or selects for traits that are already existing in the population. The current local environment determines which traits are going to be selected for or selected against in any given population. So homology is similarity that results from common ancestors. So homologous structures are going to be similar structures, and they are going to come from a common ancestor. So your homologous structures are anatomical resemblances. Here we can see a human forearm, an animal paw, a whale fin, and a bat wing here that are all anatomical resemblances that re represent variations on a structural theme in a common ancestor. So what you can see is they all have one bone here, then they've got two bones in here, then they've got seven that are in yellow, five, and then five through here. So it's the same pattern. It's just been modified slightly different in each organism. When we look at comparative embryology, it reveals anatomical homologies that are not necessarily visible in the adults. So if you look, all vertebrate embryos have a postanal tail and pharyngeal arches. So you can see that in all of them, whether or not they have a tail when they get older or not. The stygial structures are ones that served an important function in the organism's ancestors or past, but no longer do today. Examples of homologies at the molecular level are genes that are shared among organisms that are inherited from a common ancestor. So occasionally, organisms do inherit genes that they just no longer are using because they come from a common ancestor. Evolutionary trees are hypotheses about the relationships among different groups. So the homologies form nested patterns in these evolutionary trees. So your evolutionary tree can be made using different types of data. So for example, you can make them off of anatomical data and DNA sequence data. So here you can see each of these numbers represents a branch point. And when there's a branch point, there's a new characteristic that has evolved. So there are other causes of resemblance. Convergent evolution is the evolution of similar or analogous features from distantly related groups. So analogous traits are going to arise when groups independently adapt to similar environments in similar ways. So it does not provide information about the ancestry. So homologous structures are going to have a common ancestor. Analogous structures do not have a cam common ancestor. They just had similar ways of adapting to something. So this can be seen here. You've got a flying squirrel and a sugar glider. Both have a similar adaptation with this membrane between the upper and lower limbs. However, they have separate 
different ancestors and are in very different parts of the world. So your fossil record can also provide evidence of the extinction of species and the origin of new groups and changes over time. So this allows you to see changes in this hoof over time, how they gradually changed. So here from one bone down here, you can see all of these have two prongs on the bottom. The diacodexis is an early even-toed undulate. So fossils can be used to document these important transitions. For example, the transition from land to sea and the ancestors of the cetaceans can be seen on the fossil record. So here you can see where the common ancestor is, and some of them went into the sea, and then you had those that went onto the land. And here you can see the similar bone structures in these organisms with having pelvis, femur, tibia, and foot. So biogeography is the scientific study of the geographic distribution of species. It provides more evidence for evolution. So Earth's continents were formerly united in a single large continent called Pangaea, but they've since separated by continental drift. And understanding how the continents have moved and the modern distribution of species has allowed us to predict when and where the different groups evolved. Endemic species are ones that are not found anywhere else in the world. Islands are known to have many endemic species that are often closely related to species on the nearest mainland or other island. So Darwin explained that species from the mainland colonized the islands and then gave rise to new species as they adapted to the new environments. So in science, a theory is going to account for many observations and data, and it attempts to explain and integrate a great variety of the phenomena. Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection integrates diverse areas of biology. It also stimulates a lot of new research questions. So ongoing research continues to add to our understanding of evolution.